this presentation, we're going to focus on marine microbes. These organisms make up a wide variety of organisms and life that's found in the oceans. The microbe or word microbe refers to any variety of assemblage from the groups of viruses, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotic microorganisms. So it's not specific to one domain, but is more in reference to the relative size of those organisms. About 98% of the ocean biomass is made of these, uh, this assemblage or this group of small microorganisms. And there's a large vari variety in terms of the habitat as well as the ecological roles of these organisms. So, oh, taking a closer look at the marine ecological roles. These organisms supply more than half of the world's oxygen. They make up the majority of primary production in the ocean, despite the fact that we tend to think of larger macroorganisms, such as kelp producing a lot of that, uh, uh, conducting a lot of that photosynthesis. Um, they moderate biogeochemical processes and are indicators of ecosystem health. So the uh, indication of these organisms in excess uh, particularly in something such as a, a harmful algal bloom might be something that is indicative of a problem within the ecosystem. There are some coastal extremities when it comes to these organisms and their habitat. They can ex occupy extreme habitats where there's either a, a low or a high pH level, a high salinity, and so on and so forth. Extreme environments are going to be, um, when they do, occupy these extreme environments, they're going to require the production of different molecules in order to support their survival. So within hydrothermal vents, organisms have to have a higher production of hydrogen, as an example. Um, saline organisms that live in saline environments are going to have higher levels of osmolites and glycerols, some different type of structures that are important for their survival. And then there's proteins that are prevalent within Arctic marine sediment organisms. Um, so we find these cold adaptive prote proteins that enable those organisms to survive in, the, in that particular cold environment. Microorganisms can also occupy regions such as coastal mudflats, and they help with cleaning up pollution by breaking down petrochemical residues. And uh, there's an article here related to just as an example of how they can help with the cleaning and the kind of cleansing of these different chemicals within the ocean, but you could always do a quick search for that. Humans tend to use microbes as well. They're, for example, uh, it's an organism called the Paracoccus zeaxanthus peyri, which produces um, ex exopolysaccharide molecules uh, that have consumer commercial potential as moisturizers and antioxidants. You could do a quick search, though, as I mentioned, and find a myriad of these organisms and how they're starting to be harvested and used in uh, various different commercial purposes. Another organism called Pseudomonas guazini uh, is a bacterium which secretes a form of natural polyester called polyhydroxylinate. <laughs> that can form the basis of a biodegradable packing material. So especially as we move to the ocean to find solutions for many of our problems on in a terrestrial environment, we find more and more of these organisms with some almost miraculous capabilities. Viruses are something that we don't talk about very frequently or think about in terms of a marine environment, but of course the oceans have viruses. They're the most abundant entity, however, as there are 10 million viruses per milliliter in the surface seawater. Um, just technically, in case we didn't quite get to this in our biology classes, the definition of a virus is a non-living infectious intracellular, intracellular parasite. So it's something that can, uh, it's not alive, but it does have, carry genetic material. And its whole I guess, goal or objective is to allow for that genetic material to be carried forth, but it does need a living host in order to allow that to happen. Gnarly little creatures. Um, there are some benefits, however, <laughs> so I say they're gnarly, 
Um, they are able to change particulate matter into dissolved chemicals. They also can do what we call lice or cut open cells that cause uh, that can help nutrients to be returned to the water column. So if you have a bunch of cellular material, uh, these marine viruses can help to break open those cells and release all of those useful nutrients. However, it is um, very costly to living organisms. It can infect marine organisms and humans, and also it can affect gene expression because it will actually insert its genes into the genes of a, of a um, normally reproducing and living organism. Bacteria and archaea are two important groups uh, as well. Bacteria consist of single-celled organisms that are classified by shape, and we tend to see a circular structure or cosi, a rod structure or bacillus, or a spiral structure or a spirochete. Um, the, they are responsible for various chemical processes in the ocean, and there's three different groups. One is the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, such as in this example here. Uh, another is ammonia oxidizing types of bacteria, which are going to take and use this and be involved in this pro process of nitrification through the oxidization or the um, addition of oxygen to ammonia. And then primary producers, which are going to take energy from the sun and generate um, usable energy um, for uh, use in cellular work, such as ATP. Cyanobacteria is the most genetically diverse group, and it also constitutes and has the oldest fossils that we have on record, records through stromatolites. These are primary photosynthesizers, and they create oxygen in the environment, and they also fix marine nitrogen, so they're incredibly important organisms. Archaea are largely extinct group of organisms, but they tend to be single-celled organisms that are going to look similar to bacteria but have a different domain and then also have some different characteristics. They were originally thought only to be in extreme environments but are found in fresh and salt water commonly. They perform the first step of nitrification. So they're involved in this, this element here, in this nitri nitrogen fixation portion of things. Eukaryotes, again, are going to be organisms that have a different type of cell structure. They're also going to be an organism um, that are make up the majority of organisms we think about. And in terms of microbes, we find that there are quite a few of these plankton species. You all are probably most familiar with, of all the microbes, most familiar with plankton because we hear about them quite often. They, there are marine and freshwater organisms that, because they're not motile or they're too small and thus weak against uh, swimming against the current, they exist in a drifting state. So plankton cannot, while they can kind of scoot around, they're not going to be able to really move in a meaningful way. So um, a couple different examples of these organisms. Phytoplankton are the ones that are going to be photosynthesizers, include diatoms, dinoflagellates, coccolithophores. Um, zooplankton are a common ones are going to be protozoans and metazoans. But we also have larval invertebrates and fish that are going to uh, make up this kind of temporarily con contribution to the micro microbe kind of market of organisms. Additionally, we have, we have mycoplankton, which are fungi and fungus-like organisms, and bacterioplankton, which are going to be those bacteria and archaea. You know what, forget that last one. They're a different, they're like bacteria and archaea. Um, protista is going to be a type of phytoplankton that is autotrophic. Uh, they are a type of algae that live near the surface. They can also be a zooplankton form, and these are going to be small protozoans or metazoans. Most of these are going to be single-celled, and um, examples of organisms that cause uh, what I mentioned earlier, this harmful algal bloom, include diatoms and dinoflagellates. And I should mention protista, while they look similar to eukaryotic organisms, are, are an entire, or sorry, to um, um, maybe 
larvae and things along those lines, they are going to be part of a domain protista, so quite different. Um, there's a quick video I have here, which I'm not going to show during this presentation, but I encourage you to look at called The Secret Life of Plankton, uh, which is a TED Talk, and it gives you a really good overview of some of these species. And that's all for that. I hope you enjoy learning a little bit about marine microbes.